Thank you very much. How's everybody doing today? Are you ready to make better pictures? Because I am. So I want to talk about reframing your story. I essentially want to give you some tips, little things, small steps that you can take, sometimes literally, to make better photos. So let's dive right in. I want to start off with what I think is a very important tip. Keep learning and understanding. I think you've probably all heard the mantra to know your subject, to know your equipment. It is so incredibly important that you do those things, that you really understand photography, that you understand your subjects, that you're basically not surprised. So I want to share with you a favorite photo. Are you ready? A favorite photo. I'll give you a moment to digest that. Pretty amazing, isn't it? I said A favorite photo. Actually, the first photo that I was proud of, like many photographers, I got started in high school, so in my defense, I was a punk high school student when I took this picture, and I thought it was so amazing. Thank goodness things have changed since then. But there was a surprise waiting for me, two surprises with this photo. When I processed the film, I found a starburst. The sun is bursting into a starburst in the tree. I had no idea whatsoever how I had accomplished that. I had to ask my teacher, and she told me that I had stopped down the lens. Okay, so I'm starting to learn about the equipment. When I went to make a print in the darkroom, I was shocked to see clouds in the background. I was looking through the viewfinder, looking at those clouds, and I didn't even see the clouds. So paying attention, learning more about your equipment, your techniques, your subjects, etc., so that you'll actually know what you're looking at, and you'll be able to capture better pictures. Tip number two, take two steps to the right. Not literally, I mean sometimes. Here, I'll take two steps to the right. Or something like that. So we're in Seattle today. If you're a photographer, if you've heard of Seattle, you probably know this picture. Maybe you've even taken this picture before. I see this picture so often and it drives me absolutely crazy. Because all you have to do is take a couple more steps to the right. And instead of having the Space Needle lined up awkwardly with another building, we can take a couple of steps over and get the Space Needle into an open space. Just paying attention to some of the smaller details in the scene that you're photographing, I think can make a huge difference. Number three, find a vantage point. Okay, that's easy. How do you find a vantage point? You show up. But then find another, and another, and another. And so, looking up, okay, this is totally cliche. I get it. Look, looking upward at the trees. Wow, that's very inventive. Okay, not exactly. But finding different vantage points. You find an interesting subject, a red barn out in the Palouse. Okay, well, how else can I interpret this scene? Getting down and focusing on the wheat instead of the red barn itself. Really focusing on the wheat under sunrise, that nice golden light. And just finding different ways to interpret subjects that all by themselves might not seem all that interesting photographically. So this barn is certainly interesting, falling apart. But in the landscape, not so much, but then getting down lower. And I think it makes things interesting, even though the main subject is no longer in focus. Getting down a little bit lower, getting to the subject's level, something that we're familiar with in terms of portrait photography, but we don't necessarily think about in other terms. Excluding a big portion of the subject, finding a more interesting vantage point, an old truck here, and taking a different look, looking for different details, textures, colors, What's interesting about that subject, and how can I zero in on that interesting element? Sometimes it's really obvious. The head-on shot, that's all you need. But maybe go look at a different angle, a different vantage point. Tell the horse to look toward you, and you might come up with something that's just a little more interesting or at least different, a different way of interpreting the same subject. I can't tell you how many photographers, they get somewhere, they see something they like, and at what height do they take the picture? Right here tripod height, or if they're not using a tripod, eye height, get down low. Find a way to frame up that subject in a more interesting way. Sometimes you find something interesting, in this case a red barn. Hey, we can see through the window, and we can see grass off in the background. Interesting. But maybe I can make it even more interesting. So not giving up when you think you found an interesting photo, moving around a little bit, and in this case finding a vantage point where now I can frame up another window inside of the window frame. Cliché? Sure. But I like it. It works. And again, coming, you, know, you come up on a subject, something really interesting here, an abandoned farmhouse in the Palouse. I show up, here's my spot, I take a picture, except 
moving just a little bit over to the right in this case gives me what I think is a much better and more compelling vantage point for that subject. So getting off the beaten path, this is one that I talk about a lot with photographers, and especially when I'm going somewhere that's maybe a little bit of a tourist destination, and of course I'm going to go to the tourist attractions, but then trying to find the more interesting details. Now sometimes you just stumble upon something that's just really cool and interesting. This little pup, I mean, he is so adorable, am I right? You notice dog parking sign there? For so sometimes you'll just stumble upon things, but then you go where you think you're supposed to go or where the guidebook told you that you were supposed to go. And it's interesting, but it's kind of, in this case, just a piazza and a church in the piazza. Sometimes in that same spot, you might find something that's interesting. I love the colors on the buildings here, the windows, the shadow line cutting across the image. I think it's pretty interesting. But if we get off the beaten path, go down the smaller streets, go the back way, go in the back alley, go find something that might be a little bit more interesting, and in many cases, just focusing on little details. So I was at Campo de Fiori in Rome, and a couple blocks away on a little tiny side street, I found this amazing old door with a wonderful play of light, locks and paint that was chipping and peeling and the wood was all deteriorating, and it was amazing, just a phenomenal experience. Getting back behind another piazza on this back street that seemed a little bit scary and nobody was really gonna go back there, and then I found this really cool door with some ivy hanging down. And to me, that was a lot more interesting than sort of the main attractions, as it were, in this case in Rome. But anywhere you are, trying to find those more interesting scenes somewhere off the beaten path. So using a tripod. <laughs> I, you know, in theory. Do you know how often I use a tripod? Not very often, but sometimes I have to. So in some situations, you've got good light, I'm nice and sturdy and stable. My lens has stabilization. I don't need a tripod. But then the sun goes down and you don't want to have to crank up the ISO setting or you want to use a longer exposure. So here, for example, using shutter speeds around 30 seconds, give or take, so that I can get the water of the East River really smoothed out, get more interesting reflections on the river itself. And I think it works out much more nicely than cranking up the ISO and trying to shoot handheld. So finding the light, I know photography, it's all about the light, right? But to me, what's almost more important are the shadows and the reflections, the other things that light does. And in many cases, it's the shadows that really define the light or make the light more interesting. So I love photographing in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington state. It's really remarkable farm country that's got these rolling hills, it's remarkable. But without shadows across those hills, you don't really realize how special the landscape really is. And so trying to find situations, creating situations, where you're not only taking advantage of the light and not just capturing the light, but also capturing the shadows and using those shadows to your advantage. I make a complete fool of myself when we've got clouds passing through in the sky above, shadows moving across the landscape, and I get so excited about the moving shadows, and here comes another shadow, and we've gotta make sure that we capture this at just the right moment. It can be a wonderful experience, and it can make for much more interesting photographs, I think. In many cases, the shadows, the negative space, as it were, the opposite of the light, is sort of what makes the image a lot more interesting, a lot more compelling, and for me personally, the experience of capturing the images that much more interesting as well. So really looking for that special light, looking for the shadows. In some cases, with this staircase in Rome, for example, it was all about the shadows. The shadows were literally the only reason I took the photo. It just happened to be that there was some light there creating the shadows. And reflections. I mentioned already getting off the beaten path. That was certainly necessary with this photo in Hallstatt in Austria, where in order to get an interesting photo of this place, I needed to get out onto the water. I was able to rent a boat, get out onto the water, and incorporate the reflections, not just the light coming off the buildings, but the light reflecting off of that water. And sometimes just focusing on only the reflections. So these are some nice colorful buildings in Venice, Italy, being illuminated by the bright sunlight, and I turned away from those buildings and focused my lens down on the surface of the water itself in order to photograph the incredible reflections down below. And sometimes, you know, combining various different techniques, focusing on the reflections, then using a long exposure, a relatively long exposure, panning across the water in this case, so that it's just about the texture and the color of that light. Consider HDR, I know. 
HDR, the photography technique that everyone loves to hate. But when I'm talking about HDR, I'm not talking about hyper-saturated and hyper-detailed and all this sort of thing. I'm talking about just trying to preserve as much detail in the scene as I possibly can. So here, a night photograph, for example, I'm using HDR, capturing multiple exposures so that I can preserve all of the information in that scene. And then in post, I'm not trying to create something that's hyper-realistic. I'm just trying to preserve the information that was already there. So when I'm creating HDR images, by and large, I'm focused on trying to preserve information in the scene and make it look like a normal photographic image as much as I possibly can. Sometimes they get a little over the top, just a little bit. But by and large, I'm trying to create images that just have more detail than would otherwise be possible. Here, looking through a keyhole at St. Peter's Basilica, and I could not capture this image without HDR. I could have a nice white blob in the background, or I could have pitch black in the foreground, but to combine both, I need HDR in order to put all of that together. So it's just about more information, more detail in that case. There's no question, sometimes when it comes to photographic images, I get really lucky. Really, really lucky. But sometimes I make my own luck. So again, out in the Palouse, just to give you another example from out there, look, a crop duster way up in the sky in the clouds. And look, there he goes away. I missed him. And then maybe he comes back toward me and I'm able to get a photo, but now the light's no good and there's a road in the way and it's just not the best image, all things considered. But then I get really lucky. This was at a focal length, if I remember correctly, of around about 70 millimeters. So bring your umbrellas. And sometimes you get lucky. You just happen to be at the right place at the right time and you get an interesting shot. But things get a whole lot better when you call the crop duster and say, hey, where are you going to be spraying? And can we coordinate? So I coordinated with the crop duster, find out where he's going to be spraying, told him, no, I don't like that crop. Can we get a wheat field instead? So the next day, he's out spraying a wheat field. And I get the photo because I'm coordinating with my subject. Now, this can be a little more challenging with wildlife photography, to be sure. But to the extent that it's possible, do your best to try to create luck, to be there at the right time, to get to the right places at the right time, to have enough time to deal with various circumstances. And whenever possible, try to coordinate with your subjects. So bad weather. We're in Seattle, notorious for rain. It's raining today. We're going to embrace it. And we're going to create more interesting photos, possibly, as a result. And so, you know, when the rain starts, the umbrellas come out. Well, maybe not so much in Seattle. They don't really use umbrellas in Seattle. But in other places, the umbrellas come out. That can be interesting. I wish that I had made my own luck and called this woman and said, hey, can you wear red shoes and a red jacket and walk with your umbrella through the streets of Rome? But no, I just, I was lucky. I happened to be out there in the rain, and so I had opportunities that I might have otherwise missed. And incorporating that weather into your photographic images, making the rain perhaps the prime subject, or whatever the weather might actually be. It can add a sense of mood, etc. So using the weather to your advantage, especially after the rain stops and the light comes out really nice and you've got some puddles to work with. But the point being is that there are lots of opportunities to change the mood of a subject, to create a more interesting scene by embracing the weather, especially when the weather gets to be a little less than ideal. And I actually find that in many cases, the conditions where I'm least comfortable, where I'm cold, and wet and grumpy is when I'm able to create photographs that I think are a lot more interesting, that are more compelling. And so sometimes what I might consider to be bad weather actually works out really nicely. On this trip, I never thought that our little rental car was actually going to get us home through the snowstorm, but I was glad to have some photographs in the process. And then sometimes finding contrasts. The clouds look really, really gloomy, but maybe you can find a subject like this canola field that's really bright and really vibrant, and that contrast can make for an interesting photo as well. So process for the why. Essentially, realizing your vision, and sometimes you know, our vision might be a little bit clouded. Sometimes it's really clear exactly what we're trying to accomplish. I took this photo in Tokyo. This was sort of the first real photo that I took once I had arrived. When I clicked the shutter, have you had this experience? I thought, this, this is going to be a great photo. I'm just totally going to love this picture. Then this elderly woman across the way, this happens to be in a cemetery. There's some shrines nearby. This elderly Japanese woman signaled me over to her, and I thought that I was going to be in very big trouble. And I didn't even know what I had done wrong. I was trying to be very respectful and cautious. She didn't speak any English. 
I'm like, great, now I'm gonna get yelled at and I'm not even gonna know what she's trying to tell me. But instead, she actually taught me to pray at a Buddhist temple with no English, just through sign language and kind of showing me around. And it was just an amazing experience. And I wanted to try to convey a sense of that mood and the photo wasn't doing it for me. Well, thank goodness we have software that enables us to accomplish more of our vision. You know, when photographers or anybody really asks me, oh, did you work on that image in Photoshop? My first answer is, uh, yeah, of course I did. And second of all, I'm flattered that they were happy enough with the picture that they thought special software was needed to make it possible. But sometimes special software is necessary. And in this case, I needed to have something that would change the mood of the photo to convey more of the experience that I had. So I tried to add sort of this more classic look, make it look a little bit older, timeless, a little bit more mysterious perhaps, and just trying to get the mood of the experience infused into the photo that I felt was missing originally, but I'm not gonna be shy about using Photoshop or other tools in order to impart that mood into the photo itself. Plan your timing. The when really does matter. I know sometimes you don't have much choice. You're here now. This is your moment to take the picture and tomorrow you're off somewhere else or whatever the case might be. But to the extent that you have some control over your timing, try to pay attention to that timing. So for example, this old abandoned farmhouse, we saw this same farmhouse a little bit earlier. It is a subject that faces toward the west and therefore it must be a sunset photo, not a sunrise photo. And for about the last 10 years visiting the same part of the country, I've always photographed this subject under late afternoon light. I thought, why am I doing that? There are other times of day. And then I remembered that sunrise comes really early in the Palouse, and that's why I didn't take sunrise photos there previously. But I got an interesting photo, a variation on a theme, because I got out there at a different time, thought about that timing, and made a different image. Knowing when the full moon is going to be out there and getting out even before sunrise at like four in the morning and the whole drive there wondering what on earth am I doing out here in the middle of the night? But then waiting for that moon to get down a little bit lower, the sun to start coming up over the horizon the other way and creating some interesting photos as a result. You know, subjects, oh, well, the subject is facing toward the east and so we need the early morning light to cast some illumination on the Duomo in Florence. Maybe I should go at sunset. Maybe Mother Nature didn't cooperate and I got a crummy sunset. But then I'll wait a little while because what happens after golden hour and after the sunset? Then if we're lucky, if the conditions are right, we get blue hour. And sometimes that works out really, really nicely. So sometimes the photo that you're happiest with is not the photo that you were anticipating at all. And try new things. I'm just gonna give you a simple, a real simple basic example here and that is to use longer exposure. So when you find a subject that seems kind of interesting, except it's just rocks and water, but what happens if I put a neutral density filter in front of that lens in broad daylight, get a nice long exposure, and maybe come away with something that's a little bit more interesting for that subject? Photographing a lighthouse. It's sort of just a lighthouse. It's a really beautiful coast. It's a cool lighthouse. There's nice water, etc. But again, using a longer exposure. And I'm not suggesting that when you want to get creative, you should just automatically use long exposures, but rather to think about what sorts of techniques might work for a given subject. And again, I'm just using this one example as an illustrative point, but then taking that technique and trying to find other unique ways to implement it. So long exposure, you might think water. What about clouds that are moving across the sky? Last time I was in Seattle, Clouds moving across the sky pretty quickly. Let's go find the Space Needle and see if we can find a more interesting interpretation of that same subject that I photographed so many times before, but with a motion blur caused by the clouds going through the sky, going across the sky up above. And finally, focus on you. No, I don't mean selfies, although that's okay too. But focus on what excites you, what you're passionate about as a photographer, and I promise you that will help you create better photographic images. And more importantly, if you're taking photographs that excite you, that you're passionate about, you're going to enjoy the process that much more. Remember that photo that I showed you at the beginning? Nobody else has ever told me that they like that picture. My wife did once, but she was lying to me. I'm the only one who likes that picture, this particular photo but that's enough for me because I'm taking pictures for me first and foremost, and I hope that you will do the same. Thank you very much, you guys.